Hello there and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. We are now in Chapter 4 of this series entitled False Obstacles to Healing. And if you remember from our previous session, we began talking about God's hidden will uh, on with sickness. And then we talked about that God is teaching me something through sickness. And we found out it wasn't true. And then that God is disciplining me through sickness or to humble me. And we ended up that session with I gave authority to the devil or I opened the door to the devil. And that's why God cannot heal me. And today we're continuing with the fifth uh, so-called false obstacle, which is reaping my own wrongdoings. In other words, some people don't dare to come to God and ask for healing because their current sickness is the consequence of their own doing or of their own sowing, sowing and reaping. Example, you went to the ski and you broke your leg or you went to the pool and you jumped from too high and you broke your back or you smoked and drank all your life and now you have cancer and you believe that you need to endure that sickness because you did it with your own hand to yourself and you have to pay for your own sins. And I met so many Christians thinking that and having these ideas that they have to suffer and endure and pay or reap for their own doing through sickness. But that's not true. It's false, it's wrong, it's, and it's a lie from the devil. And I really want you to be free today. Listen to the word of God. If you have the Bible ready, let's open up Psalm 107 verses 17 to 20. I'll be reading from New King James Version, but you are uh, welcome to read from any English translation you have available. It says this, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Amen. So you see these passages about fools, about people that are not wise and they do things to themselves. They do transgressions. They do iniquities. Maybe you, do some, you did something immoral, something sinful that got you uh, where you are with your sickness. Not necessarily uh, just drinking or something innocent, but you did something immoral, something sinful, and now you're afflicted. Or someone else you're trying to pray for or to minister to. They did something sinful and now they are sick because of that, because of those sins. Like, uh, like for instance, sexual sins. You might get HIV, uh, which is transmitted sexually. And because you sinned with other women or with other men, now you're sick. And even those, the Bible says this here that because of their iniquities, the fools were afflicted with sickness, with any kind of affliction. And, but the Bible says that they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, in the midst of their affliction, in the midst of their sickness, of their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and deliver them from their destructions. Isn't God good? We serve such a good and loving God who goes so far that he is even willing and desiring to save you even when you did it with your own hand. Amen? So even when you sow your own destruction, God can make it so that you don't reap what you sow now. Amen? Let's move on to the sixth obstacle, false obstacle, which is sin. I have sin in my life. That's why sickness doesn't live. That's why I'm still sick. Or you have a hidden sin in your life and God cannot heal you. Have you heard this idea from different ministers that God cannot heal you while you have a hidden sin in your life? Go and resolve your sins or clean up your life and God then will heal you. And this is false. 
This is another lie from the pit of hell, from the devil, and let's destroy it. You know why it's false? Because all healing is by grace through faith in Christ alone, exactly like salvation. Healing is included in our salvation and is by faith in Christ alone. It's not by our own works of holiness or good deeds. Sin will never be an obstacle against healing. And I'll say this again because it's powerful. Any sin, individual, specific sin, no matter how big it is, it will never be an obstacle against healing. And I'll develop and I'll explain why. This applies both to the person ministering healing, the person who ministers healing, as well as to the person being ministered to. This principle that I just said applies to both the one who ministers and the one being ministered to. If sin was a hindrance to healing, nobody would be even saved because healing is included in our salvation. And sin was never a hindrance to salvation. And salvation was much more difficult to acquire. It required being resurrected. It required your spirit being recreated. So God had to manifest much more power at the moment of your salvation than when uh, he tries to heal you physically. And at the moment of your salvation, sin was not an issue. It wasn't a hindrance to your salvation. Do you agree with me? Sin was not an obstacle to God when we were dead in our trespasses. As the Bible says, he made us alive in Christ Jesus when we were full of sin. And sin on both sides, even repeated sin, sins that you are aware of, will never stop healing flowing from God. They might stop healing indirectly because when you sin, you undermine your own faith because you, you, it, will be, it will be more difficult for you to fight the fight of faith with your mind when you have a sin in your life. You will always doubt, uh, does God want to heal now? Will he heal now since he knows my sin? So your conscience, your mind will give you difficulty in releasing the full amount of faith needed for a healing to occur. Amen. But from God's side, he will never stop healing flowing because of your sins or the sick person's sins. The problem will be on your end. Amen. Let's say you go out on the street and witness Jesus to a person. You tell that person that she needs to get saved. It's like evangelism. Jesus died for her and she can get saved. And the person says back, well, you know, I've been thinking about that, but I got to get my life cleaned up first. Have you heard that? A lot of people, when they want to give their life to Jesus, they feel, they think that they need to clean themselves up before they come to Jesus. But when you hear that, you immediately tell her, no, 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 you cannot clean your life up. You come to him and he cleans you up. Come as you are. Isn't that right? That's how we evangelize. That's how we tell people the gospel. Maybe we convince the person she gets saved, then comes to church. Then someone comes and preaches that God wants to heal, like I do now. And if you are sick, come down in front. So that person who just got saved has an illness of some sort and comes to front to be healed. The preacher then asks her, is there any known sin in your life? The person responds, well, you know, I just got saved. I already got rid of a lot of stuff, but there are still some things that I'm dealing with, as it's probably normal as a newborn believer. Then the preacher says, then go back and sit down because you will not get healed until you get rid of those sins. Why is it then people, when people are all out there, everything is by grace, salvation is by grace, the gospel is by grace, but when they come to church, to church, it's all by works. Healing is by works. Why is that? That is wrong. Healing is by faith alone. It's not by acts of holiness, not by works, not by if you have sin in your life, God will not heal you. That's false. Let's read another passage from Mark 16, uh, verses 9 to 18. Uh, we are still in the obstacle of sin, where we think that sin might be an obstacle to healing, and it's false. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven demons. 
she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. These are the disciples. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Amen. First, we clearly see in this passage the disciples' unbelief two times. Jesus appears in front of them and rebukes them for their unbelief. But he doesn't say that he will search for other people. But instead, he sends them to preach the gospel. Why? It's not because they were smart or talented or full of faith. But they were all that Jesus had and they were there. You, you feel like it feels like Jesus almost punished them. Go and preach the gospel. You, you, you did not believe it, but go and preach the gospel so that other would believe. Jesus used what he had. He rebuked them, but he did not search for other people. Their sin, their sin of unbelief didn't stop him. Second, notice that healing... Physical healing is a sign. These signs shall follow. It, it's not a reward. Healing is not a reward for your good deeds, for your holiness. See, healing is a sign for unbelievers and for believers, for some believers. When God heals someone, irrespective of their state, that attracts people to repentance. That attracts people to God, to the gospel. The gospel becomes attractive. It's, the gospel is already attract, attractive. It's just that we present it in a more attractive way now. Third, we're still in this passage, the faith of the sick persons is not in play here. Jesus doesn't say anything about the sick persons uh, needing to have faith. As long as I, the minister, believe and lay my hands over the sick persons, they will recover. The same is true for you, for anybody. You don't have to have a title to be someone special. Whenever you minister healing, the sick person doesn't need to have faith, but you as a minister need to have faith. And you lay your hands over the sick person and she or he gets healed, recovers. That's what the Bible says that is supposed to happen. Their faith is not necessary. If the sick persons believed or had faith, they don't need my hands. Isn't that right? They could get healed by themselves if they had faith in the, in the first place. That's another important thing. Then there's another important thing that we need to understand and learn. In the past, some of the ministers tried to connect sicknesses with certain specific sins and categorize them. For example, unforgiveness is a sin. And we talked about unforgiveness in our previous session. If you have lower back pains, then there is unforgiveness in your life. And they make that correlation, lower back pains with unforgiveness. If you have arthritis, it is because you have a bitter spirit. So they say you need to get that bitterness out first in order for you to be, cu uh, to be cured, healed of arthritis. The same for the back pains. You need to get unforgiveness out in order for you to be healed of your back pain. And that is wrong. I'm not saying there's never any correlation. Sometimes there can be a correlation. But the problem with that type of thinking and teaching is that the moment someone comes and says, I have this problem, instantly you who ministers sees being their deliverer, deliverer who God called you to be and start being their judge. You judge the person by their sickness. You judge what they did or what they do by their sickness. And that's not good. Yes, there may be some correlation, but even if there is a correlation, you can still heal the persons regard, regardless if they take the bitterness out or not. God's power heals anything. Amen? 
then there is this saying, if there is a physical sickness, there has to be something in the spirit. Have you heard this idea? That is not true again. That could only be true if you were not born again. But the moment you got born again, all things are passed away. All things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. You have become a new creation. Sickness has nothing to do with your spirit. Sickness has to do with your body. Your spirit is holy, is perfect, is complete. It's uh, according to the nature of God. There is nothing wrong with your spirit if you're born again. If you're not born again, then yes, there might be something wrong with your spirit. Many people don't think about the logical implications of a doctrine or about the end result of something that they teach or do. And that's so prevalent, so common in the body of Christ. They say something, but they don't realize the implications, the, the end result of that statement in other doctrines, in other, in other uh, things of the Bible. And here is where systematic theology is important or to have a systematic framework of beliefs. And when you say something, you test it to see if it doesn't contradict any other beliefs that you have. You take your statement all the way to its end results in different areas, in different aspects of Bible doctrine. They usually don't take a teaching all the way to its natural conclusion. If a specific sin is the cause of a sickness or a sickness doesn't leave your body, even if you pray because of a sin in your life, then if you are continuing to be sick and then die of that sickness, it means that the, that sin was not removed even if you asked for forgiveness since, since sickness remained and you died. So even if you ask God, forgive me or take my, away my sins, if, if God took away your sin, took away your sin, then your sickness should have left. But since your sickness didn't leave and you died, then sin remained and you died in your sin and you went to hell because that sin was not taken away. That's the logical outflow, the natural flow of a statement saying that sin can keep sickness in your body. Yes, sin in general, as I said before, is the cause of all sickness. That's how sickness got into the world through Adam's sin. But the sickness doesn't have a legal right to stay or remain in your body because of some specific hidden sins in your life, some individual sins. Amen? Sickness has to flee no matter what. There's no connection there. Then another idea that I want to say, and I'll read a, a passage, you don't counsel demons or sickness. You just cast them out. A simple command, come out, is better than 24 hours of counseling. You hear so many Christians, and counseling is not bad. But if you have a spiritual problem, a demon or a sickness, that doesn't come out through counseling. It comes out through a command full of faith in the Word of God. Let's read John chapter 9, 1 to 7. Here is a passage about the bl a blind man, which is very much used to support the idea that sickness can sometimes, sometimes be caused the, of a certain sin and can stay because of a sin, your sin or your parents' sin. John 9, 1 to 7. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Can you notice even the uh, mentality of Jesus' disciples? This is something of the Old Testament. Even then, they thought that a sickness could come from a personal sin or a pa the parent's sin, and that sickness can stay because of sin. And that changed in the New Testament. Even if it was true in the Old Testament, it's no longer true in the New Testament. And I will prove, uh, based on this passage, that it's not true. 
Some Christians might say that the blind man in this passage was born by God intentionally blind just for the day when he would meet Jesus so that Jesus would be shown in a glorious light by this healing. We see that in verse 3. And this is the idea that many Christians assign to this text. Or they might say that sometimes sin or generational curse is the cause of sickness. And that's wrong. That's false. First, in the Greek, there is no punctuation as we have in English. And the translator chose to put that punctuation as they saw fit. But what Jesus could have actually said in verse 3 can be this. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him, comma, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And it makes much more sense than putting a period after, uh, before verse 4. There could have been no period before verse 4, but a comma. And the meaning changes completely. If it, if it is a comma instead of a period, then Jesus is not saying as many believe that the blind man was born intentionally blind. What Jesus is saying is that no matter the case, as long as there is day, we must work the works of him, meaning healing people in this case, and cause the works of God to be displayed in people. That's what Jesus wanted to say. That's what he meant. But the translators put the punctuation in this case in the wrong places. In the wrong place, they put a period instead of a comma. Because of the mentality of the Old Testament mentality and the Old Testament perspective that's so clinging to us. The works mentality. Second, the passage states clearly that the sickness in this case was not because the blind man sins, nor of his parents. Jesus says clearly. Neither he, this man sinned, neither his parents. So it wasn't because of the blind man's sin or his parents' sin. The, the passage states clearly that in verse 2, 3. Neither this man or his parents sinned. Amen? Third, even if we go through that line of thought that sinful actions or generational curses or as some imply or think, must have been the cause for that blind man's sickness, we can see clearly that it didn't stop Jesus. Jesus, in the end, eventually healed the man. Nothing stopped, even if it was a sin, it didn't stop Jesus. Can you see that? Jesus healed the man regardless of any sin that might have been in that man's life or in his parents' life or any generational curse. Jesus healed the man. And that's what we're supposed to do. I hope this passage is no long, will no longer be interpreted by you in the way it has been interpreted until now. And I hope the Holy Spirit brought some clarity there and light. And that's the purpose of this series. That's the pur purpose of teaching. To bring light and to make us free. The truth will make us free. Let's read one more passage from Luke chapter 5 verses 17 to 26. I'm taking all these wrong ideas one by one and destroy them. I, I hope you see that by now. Luke 5 17 26. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. This paralyzed man, led down through the roof in Capernaum, needed first and foremost what? Physical healing, not forgiveness of sins. Physical healing. He was paralyzed. That's how we would think, right? When you, if you had seen that man first. However, what is the first thing that Jesus tells him? If you look in the text, man, your sins are forgiven you. That's the first thing Jesus told the man. Even if there were sins that caused his paralysis as a consequence, Jesus forgave them all and then healed the person. 
Isn't Jesus wonderful? Isn't God wonderful? He forgave. He didn't need it to know what sins that guy had. He just said, you are forgiven of all past, present, and future, and now you're also healed. God is so wonderful. He's so powerful, so loving. It's such an honor to follow him and to live for him. When you realize how much he loves us, how good he is, we, you, just, you just begin worshiping him and exalting him and praising his name. Another thought here. We are representatives of Jesus Christ. Has Jesus ever tell a person, I tell you what, God wants you free, but you have a problem here, and until you get that fixed, I cannot help you. Did he ever say that? No, he never said that. We are to look more like him every day. If he didn't say that ever to anyone, then we shouldn't say that ever to anyone. Never. Amen? One more passage about growing into Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 to 15. The Bible says this. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery, trickery of man in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. We are to grow up in all things into him to be like Christ. We are to grow up in all things into Him, to be like Christ, to show Christ on the outside. We are to grow into Him, into the image of Him, into the likeness of Him, and to behave more like Him, to do more the things that He did. That's what we are called for here on earth. This growing is on this side and not on the other side. It's while we are here on earth. There won't be any growing into Christ in heavens, in the new heaven and the new earth. There won't be teachers and pastors and evangelists in heaven to help us grow. They are only here on earth with this purpose, not in heaven. And we need to come to the unity of faith in, on this earth. There's a unity of faith. There's a body of faith to which not all believers has uh, have arrived yet they know bits and pieces but there's a whole body a systematic a consistent body of faith of knowledge that all christians need to come up to and that body of uh, knowledge and faith is christ himself how he functions or how what he does how he thinks all these things there's a unity there and not all believers are yet there but we are to get there here on earth because in heaven will be really easy to be in unity and to all believe the same thing and to know all the things. Isn't that right? But here on earth, we are not yet there. That's why we have this helper, these helpers, pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles, prophets. Amen? James 5, 13 to 16 says that this is another sacred cow where people think that you need to confess sins first before you are healed of any sickness. Let's read it together. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. First and foremost, here are a few distinct cases or categories with distinct remedies and prescriptions. Let's see. We have the first, the suffering and the afflicted in the soul. Affliction, and suff affliction usually is of the soul, uh, at least in this passage. What is the remedy? Pray. If you are afflicted, pray. Second category, second case, cheerful. Is anyone cheerful? What is the remedy? Sing praises. The third case, sick. 
If you are sick, what's the remedy? What's the prescription? Call the elders to pray over you and anoint you with oil. And fourth, you have committed sin. If you have committed sins, the remedy is that they will be forgiven to you. The second thing I want us to notice in this text is that we can see that suffering or affliction of the soul is a separate category from physical sickness. They are not one and the same. You can have them both, but they are different. Third, notice something else in verse 15, that it says, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So the idea that sin is always the cause of a sickness is disproven here. Because if there was a sin, if there always uh, was, was a sin there, there wouldn't be an if, if he has committed sin, but he might not have committed sin and still be sick, right? Not every sickness is caused by a specific individual sin. But even if a sickness is caused by a sin, that sin is forgiven immediately. Amen? And fourth, in the same verse 15, we can observe that the person is healed physically first and then his sins are forgiven. Can you see the priority? Can you see the order? This is the order, even in Jesus' sacrifice. Healing came first because we were healed by his stripes when he was whipped before the cross. His stripes came before the cross. And we were healed by his stripes before he got to the cross. And forgiveness of sins came after by his blood when he died on the cross. Amen. So even in this case, you see healing coming first, physical healing, and then Sins are forgiven if the person committed them, but the person might not have committed them. Is, is this clear? Does this bring you freedom and liberty to believe that sin, any sin, any hidden sin, yes, you need to resolve sin. You need to walk, walk in holiness, but not for you to get healed. It's not a condition for you to be healed or remain healed. Sin is damaging you. It's not a problem from God's side because God, in God's perspective, sin was already paid for. He doesn't hold you responsible anymore. Sin is no longer imputed to you, the Bible says in Romans, because it was paid for. But sin has another side to it. It's on your side. Sin is death. It's spiritual and physical death. So the more you sin, it brings death to you, physical death, and also death to your faith, death to your family, death to yourself, death in other areas of your life, spiritual death. It's death. That's why you don't want to sin. Not because God says so. Amen? But this is for another series. Let's move on to the seventh false obstacle. And this one is entitled, The Sick Person's Lack of Faith. People sometimes think, Christians think, that a person does not get healed because of their lack of faith. And I already said a lot of things about this, but I will just summarize quickly. We are talking here about a sick person being ministered by someone else. Christians and non-Christians without faith or healing can be healed when Christians exercise kingdom authority. Amen? Every time a dead person is raised to life, it proves that the person being ministered to doesn't need to have faith. Jesus raised someone to life, that young man. He raised him up to life. And not just that young man, but also Lazarus. Was, was there any faith on the dead person's side? No. Jesus used his own faith. So the sick person doesn't necessarily need faith or the lack of faith is never a blockage against healing on the sick person's side. Then in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 16, we already read this passage before, the healing of the man, the lame man at the gate of the temple, who had faith in the name of Jesus. The lame man? No. Peter, the apostle, of course, he was the one having faith for healing and not the lame man. And the lame man was healed. Peter said, what I have, I give you. Amen. So I hope this false obstacle is out of the way and is destroyed for good. Let's move on to the eighth one. Lack of prayer and fasting. That's, this is another idea, false obstacle that Christians allow in their mind. They didn't fast enough or they didn't pray enough to see more healing and, or to get someone healed. Now, while praying in tongues is important for being refreshed, built up, or to release more faith, you basically build your mind 
and your body to align itself with your spirit, with the faith that is in your spirit. And then faith and power flows when you pray in tongues. The Bible says that in Jude 20, you built up yourself on your most holy faith. You bring yourself to the level of the faith that you have inside, in your spirit. But prayer in tongues is not necessary and is, it is not a direct requirement for you to heal the sick. Your prayer in tongues doesn't heal the sick. Amen. There's no, there's no direct correlation between the two. Prayer in tongues indirectly heals more sick because it releases more of your faith. It takes away the blockages of your mind, of your conscious mind. It takes away your unbelief. That's how prayer in tongues affects the healing. But it's not required for you to be able to heal the sick or cast out de devils. There are two accounts in the gospel of the same situations, and we read them before, that Christians sometimes use as an excuse that they didn't fast or prayed enough when they don't get results. These accounts are in Matthew 17 verses, verses 14 to 21 and Mark 9, 14 to 29. Let's take the time to read them. It, they are not too much, too much. And I love reading the word of God. Matthew 17, 14 to 21. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And the second passage, Mark 9, 14, 29, is the same situation. Let's read it. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they could, should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming of the mouth. So he asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, to it Death and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. Amen. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Now let's see in verses 21 from the first passage and verse 29 from the second passage. This is one verse that people build a doctrine on all around. This verse that this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Yep, in order to get all those demons out, you have to do prayer and fasting. You have to pray and fast long hours to be able to cast out devils and heal the sick. What other verse in the Bible says that in order to cast out demons, you need to pray and fast? Can you tell me another verse outside of this verse? What other verse? Where is there another place where Jesus or Paul or any of the apostles told us to pray and fast to cast out devils or to heal? 
Jesus always said, in my name, cast them out. Matthew 10, 8 says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, clean the lepers, freely you have received, freely you, have, you give. But now all of a sudden, demons would not go out until I stop eating? Does that make any sense? I mean, if I pass the refrigerator 14 times a day, the devil will, will come out. We'll say, oh, this guy is not eating. We have to come out. Does that make any sense? No, that's false. Fasting and praying, does, prayer doesn't affect the demons per se. Doesn't affect sickness per se. It affects you to be able to release more faith and power. When Jesus said that that kind cannot go out without fasting and prayer, as I said before in other sessions, he was referring to the unbelief and not to demons. That kind of unbelief doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. Because we could see in the text, if you paid attention, that that guy was manifesting himself exteriorly a lot, moving at the mouth, gnashing his teeth, being rigid, and then he was dead after he was re uh, delivered by Jesus. There were a lot of external signs that could have affected the disciples' faith. And that kind of unbelief doesn't come out. So your unbelief comes out through prayer and fasting, as I said before. Your mind opens itself more and is stronger in the Word of God when you pray and fast. This kind of unbelief cannot be overcome except for fasting and prayer. The direct cause was natural unbelief that comes through the five senses. The direct reason why disciples could not cast that demon out was natural unbelief that came through the five senses. When they saw what happened, they, they uh, entered into unbelief. And that kind of unbelief comes out only by prayer and fasting. If you read the same story in other Gospels, you will notice that even after Jesus spoke on the boy, he started manifesting and foaming, showing to be worse than before. And many times when we pray for sick people, they become worse than before. That's a, that's a pattern. That's something that happens very often. And it's a tactic of the devil to, to bring you to unbelief. That does harm on your faith and can produce unbelief. You begin acting in the natural and you come from faith into unbelief. And maybe you shout louder or uh, do some other stuff. But your mind is slowly sliding into unbelief if you're not careful and if you're not strong enough. However, Jesus didn't do that. He acted normal and he didn't repeat himself. Yes, you can repeat yourself. You can command multiple times. But it's important what happens in your mind. Don't let your mind slide into unbelief. But Jesus, we see that he didn't repeat himself. He said it only once and then stood on his command. In order to maintain that kind of firm faith, you need prayer and fasting. Is that clear? Clearly understood? Prayer and fasting doesn't give you more power or growth in faith. It just releases more of the power and faith that is already in you, in your spirit, by peeling off the layers and blockages of the mind, stopping it. That's what happens. If you put your faith in prayer and fasting, and this is so important, if you trust in your mind, in your level, and in, your, in the amount of your prayer and fasting, then there will never be a time when you will feel that you prayed or fasted enough. There will never be. Well, when you will feel adequate enough, that you fasted and prayed enough and you're ready. You will never feel that way to be able to minister to the sick. It will always cause doubt in your mind. You will always feel unprepared. So our faith should not be on the amount of our prayer and fasting, but in the Word of God. And that's a difference there. There's a difference there. In Acts 3, 1 to 16, again, uh, with the, the healing of the lame man at the temple gate, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. They knew the power and the need of prayer, and they were going regularly to pray. However, they met the lame man before they prayed in that day. They weren't prayed up yet, and they were still capable of healing the man. Can you see that? They were not stirred up. They were not prayed up. They were going to prayer. But that didn't stop the healing to flow. Amen. And here we conclude also this obstacle, the lack of uh, fasting and prayer. And we will do one more. Lack of financial contribution to the kingdom. You didn't give enough. You didn't tie enough. 
And you hear Christians say, if you don't tithe or if you don't bring your offerings to the Lord, God will take the tithe some other ways from you. Either way. Hospital, doctors, car breakdowns, etc., etc. You hear all these ideas that if you don't tithe, if you don't give to God what is expected of you, what, what is God's part, then God will take it from you either way, through other means. Are you serious? Do you see God that pitiful? If that was true, then God is like mafia. And the tithe is like blackmail money to keep you, to keep your healing and to keep you safe. And that's extortion. God is not like that. God is not, is not like the mafia. If you don't give, I'll take it from you. Or if you don't give, I won't keep you uh, healthy anymore. God is not like that. But we have these ideas and we don't realize the consequences, the implications of what we're saying. And how those statements make God in, in our eyes and in the eyes of other people. Other ministers say that you need to sow money in order to receive healing. Have you heard this idea? You need to sow your money, sow your $100 or your $1,000 to get your healing. And that's so common. And maybe slowly it will cease to be so common. However, you can never sow money for healing because each seed produces after its own kind. Orange seeds produce oranges. Apple seeds produce apples. Isn't that right? So you cannot sow money for healing. You sow healing for healing in the worst case scenario. And that also works when you sow healing, when you pray for others to be healed. That's actually a way for you to get faster results. When you, even if you are sick, you pray for others to be healed and then your own healing comes faster. You, what you sow, you reap and you grow in faith faster. But it's never the case that you sow money to reap healing. That's false. That's a lie. It's not in the Bible. And I'll give you an example of uh, sowing healing and then reaped healing even when the person was not healed or had a, a problem with the same sickness. In Genesis 20 verse 17, we see Abraham prayed to God for Abimelech to be healed. And not only him, but his wives and his uh, female slaves to be healed and to be able to bear children. And the Bible says that God healed his wife and Abimelech's wife and the female slaves and they were able to bore children again. All the while, Sarah, Abraham's wife, was barren. But later on, we see that she was able to bore Isaac and she bore children. But at that moment, even though Abraham's, Abraham's wife was barren, he was able to pray for other female, other wives, other women to to be healed of barrenness, and they were, and they were able to bear children. So that works. Even if you're sick of a certain disease, don't feel like you cannot pray for the same sickness on other people. You might be surprised. You might get faster results for those people and for yourself. For instance, if I wear glasses and I've been praying and believing for a long time, and I believe that one day I will not wear glasses anymore. But until then, should that stop me from praying for other people for vision problems or to not wear glasses? No. I might even get faster results if I sow healing. I will reap healing. Amen? So never believe this that you didn't give enough to God and that's why you, your sickness stays where you cannot be healed. This is a lie. But if you believe it, it will act as an obstacle. It, it will stop your healing if you believe it. Because it will affect your faith and your sickness will remain. But if you don't believe it, if you destroy it, then your faith is free to flow. Amen. I think we'll stop here today. But until we see each other again, I pray that God will bless you richly in the name of Jesus. Amen.